You know, we, Jesus taught us to pray this way for a reason. Simon, welcome. You snuck in the back there. We didn't even see you. Welcome. So join me in the Lord's Prayer. You know, Jesus, when, when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us how to pray, he said it this way for a reason. But as believers, we tend to forget what Jesus told us to do. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Add a little bit to that. Romans 9 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. That's the feeling we need to start getting as believers. You know, we had so many people tell us they were coming to church this morning. And again, no one shows up. Our own church don't even show up. I wish I could cut myself off for them. I really do. If we're not doing what Jesus is telling us to do, we can't call ourselves Christians. We've been talking about stewardship the last few weeks, the biblical teaching of stewardship. And it means more than just tithing and and generous offerings. Stewardship includes everything in our lives. Everything. We're going to keep talking about it for a little bit longer. And today we're going to talk about the courage to say yes. Because as believers... Many don't have the courage to actually say yes. I'm going to pray for our offering before we go any further. We don't do offering messages, but we pray for the offering every week. You know, we had a, we, we had a couple of miracles through the week before I pray for it. You know, we, we got a, a message from Pastor Francis in Kenya. So 76 orphan kids we were looking after last week. He messages me on Sunday night, early Monday morning, and says... Pastor Gary, the money that you send me each month, can you please send it a week early? We normally send it on the first. And, and I said to Amanda, I'm just going to sit on this for a day or so. And the next morning, because he, he said, we're, we're running out of food. We've got two days worth of food left. So, you know, I'm just going to sit on this and pray about it. The very next morning, we've run out of food. We've now got 165 kids across our three churches and our three orphanages over there, from 70-something to 165 in the space of a week. And you know, one of our congregation, we, we were talking to them about this through the week, calls me on Friday and says, hey, can I meet you for a second? Friday or Saturday? Friday. Can I meet you for a minute? And hands us $1,000 to feed these kids. Come Praise on. God. That is what the church does. Those little kids, you know, they're, we're feeding them, but it's about the community. You know, if we could do that here on the Gold Coast, you know, well, we'd be doing it here as well. But we'd need $10,000 to do the same thing. Probably, actually, probably more, probably about fifty dollars or $60,000 to do the same thing here. But God answers our prayers when we trust in Him. As of the 17th of December, myself and Amanda and Emma... A couple of other people that come to church here don't have jobs anymore. But God supports us, right? God looks after us. We also had another miracle happen on, on Wednesday. A lady we know, she's not part of our church, she lives up in Bowen. Her husband is, a, is our accountant, is the church's accountant. He's actually one of our board members as well. She, rings, she tells us that she's She's got some blood clots, and Amanda says, well, you know what, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm just going to pray against that. We're going to believe you that they're gone. And a couple of hours later, she gets a message saying, one of them's gone. And I've been trying to get a, 
an appointment with my cardiologist. And um, I've got one. Now, who, who's ever tried to get into a specialist? I mean, I, I spoke to a psychiatrist here on the Gold Coast who deals with a certain group of people. You can't even get an initial appointment with him until July next year. Now. And so she, she drives to Mackay. She sees the cardiologist, has the MRI. We get a message yesterday. Yesterday, wasn't it? Saying the MRI shows that there are no blood clots in my lungs anymore. Hallelujah. Praise God. We don't need to actually be laying hands on them. We just need to be agreeing with them and praying. Yeah, and praying that it's done. Amen. Saying, Lord, we don't accept this. You, Let's pray for our offering. If you've got your seed there, just place your hand on it as we pray. Gracious Lord, you have given first to us. Though we can never repay you, Lord, we do rejoice that we can bring our gifts to you. As you take our offerings and use them to bless your world, Lord, we thank you that we can be partners with you and with one another in touching the people of the world. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this morning. Amen. You know, I believe that we have a big God. I believe with a big faith that he will do what he says he's going to do. The text we're concentrating on today, we don't have the, the text up on the screen today. We, we had a few technical issues. But the technical issues seem to be getting less in number but slightly bigger each week. But God's working on that as well. Remember I said to everyone last week, bring your Bibles with you? That might have been prophecy, perhaps. The text we're going to concentrate on today is John 21, 21 and 22. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? And Jesus said to him, if I will that you remain till I come, that he remain till I come, sorry, what is that to you? You follow me. And we're talking about the courage to say yes. The scriptures we're going to work through are John 21, 15 through to 22. Let's read them. It talks about Jesus restoring Peter. Because, you know, he's, he's restoring us as well. Verse 15 says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Now Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Verse 18 says, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you, were girded, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. He's talking to Peter here. This he spoke, signifying that what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And then the beloved disciple, John, is standing over to the side there. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple who Jesus loved, John, following who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? And Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. Is Jesus saying that to you? You say, well, what, why is this person so blessed? Why is this person seeing the miracles? What is that to you? Follow Jesus. What are you saying to Peter? I've discovered over time that the key to answering many of the questions concerning my life as a Christian is knowing when to say yes and when to say no. Courage to say no is not easy to come by. Welcome. But having the courage to say yes when you are called to give your best maybe even harder than saying no in, to the dark temptations of life. 
Saying yes when you're called to give your best could be harder than saying no. Our text today confronts us squarely in this challenge of when to say yes and how to say it and to mean it. Peter wanted to say yes, but it was difficult because he'd failed before, hadn't he? Who has failed before when Jesus has given them a task? If you haven't, probably need to try a little bit harder and talk to him more, because we all have. So let's look at a biblical background before we go any further. Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Three times he asked that question. At first glance, it appears that Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. That's what many of us probably think. But a close look at the Greek text reveals that Peter was actually avoiding commitment. Like many Christians we see, Yes, Lord, I want you as my saviour. I'll lay down my life for you. You can't even turn up for church. How can you lay down your life? Jesus had asked him, Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Do you have the highest spiritual devotion to me? And Peter replied, Lord, I know that I phileo you. I have warm brotherly affection for you. Not the same thing, is it? Perhaps Peter remembered his heartfelt but unkept promises. I will lay down my life. Peter said it. I see it all over Facebook. I will lay down my life for the cross. I call rubbish to most people who say that because they don't go to church. They don't do anything that Jesus tells them to do, so why would they lay down their life for him? It sickens me when I see believers not doing what they're called to do. Because they're the ones missing out. God's got so much more for them. I said to Amanda, at the start of this week and the end of last week, I feel the need to go back to Africa. Let me tell you. Every time I've been to Africa, I've been dragged to that plane kicking and screaming. I don't want to go. God has got that on my heart now. So sometime next year, I will be in Kenya. I will be in Uganda. I'll be in Tanzania. And I'll come back through South Africa so I get a little bit of civilization on the way home. (laughs) And that's a stretch, let me tell you, South Africa being civilization. But God's put that on my heart. So I have a choice to make. I can say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Or I can say, no. I'll lay down my life for you, but I'm not doing what you've told me to do. We have a choice to make, church. Peter as many of us, as many believers, have talked more than they could perform. I'm an apostle. Well, what have you done for Christ? I'm a prophet. Really? Prophesy and tell me. I'm an evangelist. I got this many people saved. Great. Holy Spirit did that. You were just the tool he used. Peter talked more than he could perform. And now he was more sheepish, wasn't he? In his responses. I've got brotherly love for you, but that's probably it, Jesus. He wanted more than anything to serve his Lord. And I understand that feeling. But how could he say, yes, I will love you, when he'd failed so miserably before? In in the Lord's hour of crisis. Remember? Do you know this man? Oh, no. No, no, no. I don't know him. You're mistaken. How many of us have said that? Do you know the Lord? Hmm. Sort of. Not really. Maybe. When you get a knock on the door, we're rounding up the Christians. Oh, no, I'm not a Christian. Is that going to be you, or are you actually going to go, take me? I'm ready to go. Stir it up. (laughs) Thing is, I know the response for most people. Most people will falter. And that's okay. You've got time. You've got time. So when Jesus asked Peter the third time, do you love me? He actually used Peter's word, phileo. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but that's how I do. Peter must have been pierced to the heart by Jesus' willingness to accept what Peter could say, even though it was not all that the Lord wanted and had a right to expect from him. Jesus wants the best from you. He wants everything from you. He just doesn't want some lip service on a Sunday morning. He wants everything. 
And Peter's dark failure on the night of his Lord's agony haunted him. I think of the times, sometimes, when Jesus has wanted me to do something and I've hesitated. It hurts. We're haunted by that. But Jesus wouldn't leave Peter in his defeat and he won't leave us either. He needed Peter's yes at the level where Peter was willing to begin. He needs your yes where you're willing to begin. So with great tenderness, our Lord gave his broken servant a new task, didn't he? Feed my lambs. That's what Jesus said to him. Feed my lambs. Tend my sheep. Many people won't go to church even if they admit that they have a need for it. I love that Emma went and asked these people who were having a picnic, do you want to come to church? Come and join us. They probably know they have a need for it, but they won't go. And often it's because they feel that they've failed to live up to their commitment to God from the point of their salvation. How many people call themselves believers and call themselves Christians and don't go to church because they just want a relationship with God? God only works through his church. He only works through his church. You've got to be part of one. They feel as though they've failed to live up to their commitment. But it's not too late. They give up making promises to God. Who's gave up making promises to God at some stage? I know for a while there, years ago, I did. Lord, I know you. But you know what? I can't really promise anything because I think I'm going to fail. Try planting a church. Try getting two and a half years in and, and not seeing much growth. You feel like you fail sometimes. Yeah. We know of a couple of churches that have, have closed in the last couple of weeks because of no growth. They just gave up. Yeah. How could you do that? How could you live with doing that, with not doing what he tells you to do? And some of these people that stop making promises to God stop making promises altogether. They are left in failure because they would not hear the call of Jesus to leave their failure behind and follow him. He wants us to leave our failure behind us and just follow him. Whatever that may mean for each and every one of us. I know in this room we have apostles, we have prophets, we have evangelists, we have pastors, we have teachers. We have people who pray for the sick and they get healed. We have people who Ask God for miracles. And there they are. They're coming out of this little tiny church. Yet we can still feel as though we fail sometimes. But he's just asking us to follow him. Many people have made commitments to serve Jesus Christ as missionaries, Sunday school teachers, deacons, or, or as faithful stewards of you know, the possessions that God has given them. But many have failed to keep their promises. If you're one of those that's failed before, what would Jesus say to you, do you think? I believe he would ask you, as he asked Peter, do you love me? Then do my work, follow me, feed my sheep. As Christians, that's what he's asking us to do. Go forth, make disciples, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do my work. Follow me. Feed my sheep. And the courage to say yes must not depend on someone else's response. What about this guy? What's it to you? Yeah. What about him? The disciple John was closely watching the exchange between Peter and Jesus. And I'd imagine John was probably getting some joy out of it. He's probably having a little bit of a giggle to himself. Peter turned to John and said, but back to Jesus, what about him? I know that feeling. Weary and doing everything I can do. I sometimes get discouraged because others around me seem to do so little. We see plenty of ministers who have big churches that do nothing. They've got all the people doing it for them. They don't do a thing. We get a little bit discouraged about that. But Jesus replied, what is that to you, Peter? Follow me. 
What is that to you, Gary? Follow me, I've given you a task to do. It's this irritation to be around people who it's irritating, who are always willing to cruise by on life and on someone else's work. Does that irritate you? When you do all the work and someone else just cruises through? Some of us grow weary in doing good and attempted to judge the inadequate or the faithless response of others as justification for our reluctance to say, yes, Lord, you can count on me. For me to go to Africa next year, let me tell you, that's a big step. Yes, Lord, you can count on me. Yeah, come on. Amanda can tell you how much I love Africa once I get there. <laughs> once I get there. Yeah, weeks without toilet paper. Not being able to drink water out of the tap. Living in red dirt. Yeah, no hot water. Being dished up some sort of mystery stew <laughs> and eating it gladly. I'm going to, I was talking to Simon just the other day, I'm trying to find out how much goats cost over there and chickens and the first thing I do when I get off the plane will be buy a couple of goats and a couple of chickens. So at least we will know what we're eating. <laughs> the food tastes good. Don't, don't get me wrong, it's a bit bland sometimes, but you look at it and you go, oh. I, we were talking to someone last night about you know, if we were to feed the homeless here on the Gold Coast, what the orphans get fed in our orphanages, they'd throw it at you. They would not accept it. These kids eat this gladly because that might be their only meal that day. It's time to act. If we're going to say, yes, Lord, you can count on me, it is time to act. This church would be full if we're inviting people to come on Sundays. Now, I know some of us are doing that. I know Amanda sent out 15 messages to people. You know, I know Emma invited some people. I know Simon's invited some people. But most people aren't coming. Most people aren't even bothering. Some people that you ask won't come. That's okay. They will in time. But some people might. What's stopping you from inviting people to church? What's stopping you from talking about Christ with them if they don't want to come to church? Are you embarrassed by the church? Are you embarrassed by your faith? Come on, Are you embarrassed by your God? Yeah. Come on, yeah. They're the only reasons I can think of why you wouldn't talk to people about Christ, why you wouldn't bring them to a church. Preferably the refinery, but why you wouldn't bring them to church? Are you embarrassed? Yeah. Are you ashamed of the gospel? I'm pretty sure it says somewhere in here, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not trying to offend people this morning, but we live in a world that's crumbling. We live in a fallen world. Are we actually embarrassed about our faith and we can't talk to people? It doesn't matter whether someone's homeless or a multimillionaire. Come on. God loves them. And in this house, they'll all be treated the same way. Yes, yes. With love. Let me tell you, some of the richest people on the Gold Coast look like they're homeless. Oh, come on. Some of the poorest people look like they're wealthy. They're all treated the same. God loves them all. The courage to say yes is necessary if we're going to be victorious. Have you been waiting on God to actually give you a miracle? To restore your family? To restore whatever? To heal an illness? You've got to have the courage to say yes first. We were talking about the, the paralytic at the, at the pool this morning. 40 years he sat by the pool waiting for Jesus to come along. He could have sort of been like a slug and wriggled across there in 40 years several times, couldn't he? But he was just waiting. The courage to say yes is what we need. No victories can be won unless we say yes. Yes, Lord, I am able to serve you. Yes, Lord, I will go there. Yes, Lord, I will give what you say to give. 
Yes, Lord, whatever it is. Yes, Lord. In our church, we're faced with a remarkable challenge. Remarkable challenge. If we were less brave, or if our cause were not so crucial, we might be tempted to run and hide. Or maybe take time away from our church responsibilities to say, you know what? I'm just going to tap out for a month. I'm not going to do church. But we've got a crucial task. Yeah, and we, we will see that. Won't be myself and Amanda over the, over the next month, but as you come into Christmas, people go, oh, you know, we just spend time with family. We're not going to go to church. Yeah. How about you just bring your family to church? They yeah. probably need, need church just as much as you do. We're not going to take time out for, from our church responsibilities because we have a task. God called us to be his church right here, right now. There's been a church in this building even when it was over at the convention centre. Yeah. At least 18 years there's been a church in this building every Sunday. One church moved out a few weeks ago. We moved in. We'd been looking for a building. God said to us, that's the one. Do it. And here we are. He wouldn't give us a building this size unless he meant to fill it. We are called to be his church. Not Gary's church. Not Sophia's church. His church. Right here, right now. We're in the middle of the Gold Coast. We're surrounded by, we've got the casino over here. You can walk 500 metres into Broad Beach and it's full of brothels. We're here for a reason. That's not so we can come and sing a couple of happy songs on, on Sunday morning and listen to me talk. We're here for a reason. Yeah, come on. God works through his church. We need to say yes to his call to make a difference in this community and throughout the world. We're making a difference in Kenya. We're making a difference in Uganda, in Tanzania called to make a difference in this community as well. Yeah. Now this community is not just Broad Beach, it's the Gold Coast. It's Australia. Jesus has the heart of a shepherd. He seeks the lost sheep. And frightened or hungry sheep are the object of his special care. I don't know where he found you, but I was pretty frightened. And I was hungry for him when, I, when he found me. So when Jesus asked Peter to take care of his sheep, he was calling him to join in the task of the great shepherd. When he's calling you to go looking for his lost sheep, he's wanting to be part of the task of the great shepherd. Great causes do not move forward without commitment. Let me say that again. Great causes do not move forward without a great commitment. Not that many years ago, we had four very successful businesses. We had a massive big house at Arundel, at Arundel Hills. God's cause to plant his church and seek the lost Feed the hungry, look after the widows. It was big enough for us to say, yes, Lord. Come on. We sold our businesses. We sold our big house to serve him. The flip side of that is now we're unemployed. And praise God for that. Yeah, come on. Because he will provide. He will give, he will give us everything we need. Because we've said, yes, Lord. We are committed. There's times, I'll put my hand up, there's times when we've said, Lord, we don't know whether we can do this. Yeah. We don't know, Lord, what did you really say? Haven't there? There's been times where we've thought, why? We're very good at making money. We could go back into the business world tomorrow. But we're committed. And I encourage everyone else to get committed. I'm not saying sell your house, sell your business, give up your job. I'm not saying that. But when he tells you to do something, or he asks you to do something, do it. 
It's a risk when we set out on the journey to do more than we've ever done before, isn't it? When we take on something that is so big and we've never done before, there's a risk. There's always a possibility of embarrassment if we fail. I've failed many times. Many times. Often here, on this pulpit, I've failed. Because God will be telling me something and I won't do it. I won't call out someone when, he, when he's saying, that person. And I'm repenting for that. Today's about repentance. Come on. Everyone should be yes. repenting. Everyone has something to repent for. Next year is going to be a season of repentance, let me tell you. There's a divide coming within the body of Christ next year. There's going to be churches that go along the state route and do everything the state tells them to do. And then there's going to be the true body of Christ. Let me tell you, we ain't going the state route. I can tell you that. And we can never know the glory of victory unless we're willing to risk defeat. We have to be able to risk defeat to see victory. We as Christians must believe that God is in the task, in everything he tells us to do. It doesn't matter who is against us. It doesn't matter who is standing against you. If God's in it, you've got victory. We must nurture the flock to maturity in Christ. Let me tell you, within the body of Christ, there's not too much maturity. Go start nurturing the flock. Bring them along for the journey. It's not about having worship music on Sundays. Yeah. True worship is obedience. Oh, yeah. Come on. I love the music, don't get me wrong. But we've actually got to mature away from our salvation experience into the call that he's got for us. Too many of us go, I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Saviour. And then sit in a pew for 60 years. We've got to stop that. You can go to any Catholic church or any Anglican church and see that today. Yes. We've got to bring the flock along to maturity. We must search for an open place in the hearts of others where we can enter in Christ's name. Single adults who are afraid of life and that it may never make sense to them must be reached by this church. Families who are holding on by their fingertips must be reached by this church. Let me tell you, next year is going to be hard. I've been saying it for, since 2017. 2022 will be hard. People will lose their jobs. They'll lose their houses. Families are going to be hanging on by fingertips. Any of these young families who have gone and bought big houses up around Pimpamar and Coomera and places like that. They won't be able to afford them next year. Sadly. Be there for them because their life's about to get really tough. Interest rates will start going up sometime after the election. Things are going to get tough for people. They're over leveraged. Young people who are desperate for assurance that they're loved, must be reached by this church. Yeah. Yeah. Young people don't believe they're loved. Yeah. They come from dysfunctional families. Yeah. They must be reached by this church. Mm. I'm going to finish up here, Daniel, if you want to almost get ready. When Jesus asked, when Jesus asked you, do you love me? Mm. Commit yourself to caring and sharing, and giving and loving. Don't just say, Jesus, I'll be your mate. Say, Jesus, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm committed to you. Yeah. What do you want from me? And although it's not easy to say yes, don't hold back. Don't hold back. 